Commander at Robb Elementary held police back, believing no more children were at risk while children were likely still dying. 911 call after 911 call coming from inside classrooms. Hushed voices, some of them children, pleading, please send police now, as nearly 20 officers were right outside. And the timeline of that Texas tragedy is becoming clearer. Minute by minute details from investigators show there was no security officer on the ground and a school door left propped open. The gunman purchased more than 1,500 rounds of ammunition, firing at least 200 of them, most inside the school. How Border Patrol agents were finally able to take down the shooter 77 minutes after his reign of terror began. The community in mourning and angry, wondering could more lives have been saved if there wasn't such a delay in the police response. Tonight, the powerful reactions from families of the victims. I think about him, what happened that day, what, what, what was going on in that classroom that he was in. He was crying out for me or something. I'm not sure. I'm just like, what was his last, what he saw last. The outrage in Houston, massive protests gathered outside an NRA convention, former President Trump speaking at the event, while other top Republicans and performers pull out. Meanwhile on Capitol Hill, an attempt at bipartisanship, where lawmakers stand as calls for gun reform grow louder. What caused a Pennsylvania home to explode late in the night, killing at least five people, four of them children? The investigation into what sparked the blast that left a house as a pile of debris. And severe weather threatens holiday weekend travel. From powerful thunderstorms to floods and tornado watches, our Rob Marciano is timing it all out. Good evening, I'm Trevor Alt in for Lindsay Davis. Thanks for streaming with us. As we come to the end of another painful week for this nation, we are learning some truly stunning new details about the police response to the mass shooting at Robb Elementary School in Uvalde, Texas. Today at a press conference, officials admitted that officers were inside the building with even more forces standing by outside, and yet it was nearly an hour and a half before they entered the classroom to take out the gunman. Response too late for the 19 students and two teachers who lost their lives, some of whom made frantic 911 calls in their final moments when officers could have acted. And tonight, the nation remains divided on how we respond to gun violence. Today, protesters taking to the streets outside the NRA's annual convention in Houston and many students walking out of classrooms across the country in protest against this latest attack on what is supposed to be a safe space. Tonight, the Uvalde community remains in anguish, and we will hear from more of those families and the brave children who experience this unimaginable horror, as well as the parents who are furiously demanding answers. But we begin tonight with ABC's chief national affairs correspondent, Matt Gutman. Tonight in that chaotic press conference. Hey, stand by, all right? I got it, I got it, okay. We learn about the fateful decision not to breach that classroom door and end a massacre. And for the benefit of hindsight, where I'm sitting now, of course, it was not the right decision. It was a wrong decision, period. Texas's top sworn officer saying the commander on scene broke the basic rules of engagement when he decided the gunman was not an active shooter, but a barricaded subject holding dozens of officers back. Based upon the information we have, there were children in that classroom that were at risk, and it was, in fact, still an active shooter situation and not a barricaded subject. Texas embraces active shooter training, and that doctrine requires officers. We don't care what agency you're from. You don't have to have a leader on the scene. Every officer lines up, stacks up, goes and finds where those rounds are being fired at and keeps shooting until the subject is dead, period. And now we learn it was 77 minutes of terror. It was a teacher who left a school door propped open when she went to retrieve a phone. Police say six minutes later, the gunman walking in through that open door seen in that video investigators are now studying. He heads to two connected classrooms, firing over 100 rounds. Two minutes later, three officers on the scene. Jesse Ortiz flips on his camera. Several more officers are there, first taking cover behind a vehicle. Did you tell them to go in? I, I was yelling is like, why don't you guys go in? Why don't you guys go in? More officers join. They enter the school. The suspect relentlessly firing. Two officers are grazed by gunfire. On the street outside, parents start to arrive frantic as children inside are being shot. You know that there are kids, right? 
They're little kids. They don't know how to defend themselves. Just after noon, there were 19 officers in that hallway, many of them with long guns. At that very moment, a string of desperate 911 calls started to come in from those two classrooms. In one room, multiple students were dead, but eight or nine were alive. She hung up when another student told her to hang up. By that time, a Border Patrol tactical team was on the scene with ballistic shields, but local police told them to hold off from confronting the gunman. Who is responsible for making that decision not to breach the classroom? If CBP was here at 1215, was it them? Uh, uh, the chief of police, he was convinced at the time that there was no more threat to the children and that the subject was barricaded. At the same time, at the back of the school, officers evacuating children. That is students still trapped in those classrooms, calling 911 and begging for help for 47 minutes. She told 911 that he shot the door at approximately 1243 and 1247. She asked 911 to please send the police now. That Border Patrol tactical team finally breaching the classroom at 1250. Investigators found that the gunman had brought over a thousand rounds of ammunition to the school. That director of public safety choking up, adding that the failures began long before Tuesday's rampage and the loss of those 21 lives. You call it like it is. It is tragic. Quite frankly, I mean, there shouldn't be anybody here. You know, ideally, we'd been able to it for, you know, identify this guy as a suspect and address it before he even thought about attacking. And tonight, Governor Abbott, who presented more than one press conference with inaccurate information, saying he was misled and promising answers for the victims' families. There are people who deserve answers the most, and those are the families whose lives have been destroyed. The governor says he's livid. I'd say a lot of Americans are livid right now. Matt Gutman joins us now from Uvalde. And Matt, I know as part of this investigation, you've learned Texas authorities are going to be reviewing this law enforcement response. Uh, Trevor, that investigation is likely going to focus on multiple possible failures here, starting with that school resource officer who initially drove right by the gunman to why that school wasn't immediately put on lockdown. They're also going to examine whether 911 calls were not properly relayed to the officers here on the scene, alerting them that there were people alive in those classrooms. And of course, the biggest question of all, why that police chief decided not to rush in his multiple dozens of officers here on the scene into that classroom, holding them back for an hour and not in that rampage. Trevor. A timeline that is objectively maddening. Matt Gutman, thank you. And now the nation and particularly the families of those so many victims want to know if more lives could have been saved as we're learning chilling new revelations from some of the children who survived, including at least one boy who played dead. Here's ABC's Maria Villarreal. Tonight, outrage and anguish in Uvalde. The community stunned to learn police were outside the classroom, waiting 77 minutes before going in, believing there were no surviving children inside with the shooter. I'm sick, I'm sick, I want to throw up, I'm angry. Today, authorities saying terrified children were calling 911 from inside the school, letting them know children were still alive and pleading for help. It's absolutely insane that any police would delay entering when a gun active armed shooter. Yes, an active shooter is in a school with children that cannot protect themselves. So much more could have been done. Authorities reading aloud the logs of those devastating 911 calls. She identified herself and whispered, she's in room 112. Well, advised her multiple dead. She's called back and said there's eight to nine students alive. Samuel Salinas and Noah Arona were best friends and inside that classroom, pictured together less than an hour before the shooting at an awards ceremony. Samuel remembers the gunman's words to the class. When he went in the classroom, he said, you're all going to die. He just started shooting people. The 10-year-old describes the rampage, saying he knew he had to play dead to stay alive. He shot my teacher and then he shot the kids. I was playing dead, so he won't shoot me. 19 of his fourth grade classmates would die along with two teachers. I kind of don't feel safe going to school and... I feel hot, and sometimes at, at night, I have nightmares too. His best friend Noah shot in the back with a bullet coming out of his shoulder. His father Oscar racing to the school to find him after hearing about the shooting. Panicked, they texted Noah's teacher, but no response ever came. And then the call from the hospital. Just put my hand on his head, and I, I, I held him as tight as I could, and I kissed his forehead, and uh, 
I told him, hey, you know, I'm, I'm so proud of you. I said, you're, you're a brave man. And uh, his thing was that. He goes, my clothes is ruined. I'm sorry. They're full of blood. You know, I was just, it was gut-wrenching. So many grieving families now starting to plan funerals for their children. Jose Flores was just 10, his grandfather heartbroken. When he died, I died hard with him. Nicholas Salazar remembering his 11-year-old sister, Layla. We're just glad that we gave her the best life we could while she was here. There was never a dull day with her. And Ana Rodriguez with one hope for her 11-year-old daughter, Maite. I don't want her just to be another face. I don't want any of those kids to be just another face. Each one of them has a story to tell. And this just horrendous act just cut everything short for them. Every parent's story just rips your heart out. Our Maria Villarreal joins us now from outside the San Antonio Hospital where that brave 10-year-old Noah is recovering. And Maria, we've heard all of these horrifying stories about the children who are calling 911. Do we know if any of them are survivors? Uh, you know, Trevor, uh, this afternoon we were able to get from police finally an account that, yes, at least one of the 911 calls did come from a survivor inside one of those classrooms. You know, families are telling me right now they have a lot of different emotions that they're going through, uh, sadness, frustration, anger. But more than anything, there is a lot of confusion right now. Uh, parents of the survivors telling me they don't know how they are supposed to send their kids back to school if they can't get some sort of truth and clarity right now. Trevor. And as we work to get those answers, we know you're helping us keep the focus on what's important, the victims in this tragedy. Maria Viral, thank you very much. Thanks. And as the investigation continues tonight, there are new details about potential missed warning signs. The statement that the gunman reportedly made on social media in the months leading up to his attack. Here's ABC's chief justice correspondent, Pierre Thomas. Tonight, devastating signals missed. Among the first warning signs, the accused shooter trying to illegally obtain a gun as a 17-year-old last September. Ramos asked his sister to help him buy a gun. She flatly refused. Then beginning in February, the suspect has a series of disturbing, apparently private conversations with a small group on Instagram pointing to a potential massacre. He had Instagram, a four-group chat, and uh, it was discussed that Ramos being a, a school shooter. Days later, Salvador Ramos again trying to illegally obtain a gun as a juvenile. On March 3rd, 2022, there was another four-person chat. Quotations, word on the street is you are buying a gun. Ramos replied, just bought something. Later, the conversations sounding more dire. On March 14th, and there was an Instagram posting by the subject, in quotations, 10 more days. A user replied, are you going to shoot up school or something? The subject replied, no, and stop asking dumb questions and you'll see. But that's exactly what he would do. The suspect's mother pleading a los niños inocentes. to the innocent children who died, forgive me. And let's bring in Pierre Thomas now. Pierre, what, if anything, do police know about the people that were in those Instagram chats? Well, tonight, police in Texas are trying to find out who participated in those private chats on Instagram. Among the critical questions, what else, if anything, did they know about the shooter's plans and mindset? And did they ever contact police? Meta, Instagram's parent company, says they're working with police on the investigation. Trevor. Pierre Thomas, thank you. And as we continue to learn new details and new information about what happened in this tragedy, we'll want to take a closer look at the timeline here and what we're learning about law enforcement's response as this all played out. So for that now, we want to bring in former San Bernardino, California police chief and an ABC News contributor, Jared Bergwan. Jared, thanks so much for being here. So let's just start right from the top here in the order of events. So this shooter crashes his truck, he fires on two people, he's outside here, and ends up actually firing at the school for five minutes before he even entered. I mean, what's happening at 911 dispatch at this point? We don't know exactly because they haven't shared the details as to the, the, the uh, dynamics going on in their dispatch center. But my guess is this is a relatively small community. 
Uh, so their dispatch center was probably completely overwhelmed. And I would imagine there's a part of this narrative that says a lot of the resources were pulled away from where the school is, going to the original shooting where the grandmother's house is. We have heard that police said that they might have actually passed the shooter uh, on his way to the school. We know that the shooter entered the school through a back door that had been propped open by a teacher. I would imagine there's probably maybe uh, different rules or procedures based on the school district. Is there standard guidance about leaving an open, un unmonitored door at a school? There is. Most schools have a pretty robust security program in place. Uh, they have what's called a single point of entry, which means that if you want to access that school during during the hours that students are there, that you got to go in through one point of entry that can be monitored and somebody can be there to potentially intercept you. So we know the first local officers entered the school only two minutes after, and there were 17 officers on sites within 15 minutes. So there was a quick response. What is the protocol then for an active shooter situation? The active shooter protocol says that you take the resources that you have and you assemble those resources and you go after the threat. It doesn't matter whether you have one officer, five officers, 12 officers, you pursue the threat in a, in a tactical, strategic way that to some degree is as safe as possible. And that, of course, underlines the thing that we've now learned that has so many people understandably across the country upset, and that is that the police commander on the scene said he chose to wait to confront the shooter because he thought this was no longer an active attack. Of course, we learned that as they were waiting, there were children trapped inside this classroom calling 911 with pleas for help. I mean, Jared, I, I know this is a chaotic situation. How does something like this happen? So I have to go back a little bit in the history of how we started dealing with active shooters. And there was that training that came out after Columbine that said, we got to put previous tactics of wait for a SWAT team, wait for greater firepower. We got to put that aside. We have to do things differently. We've also learned that recently that the, the school police chief is the one who was in command throughout this incident and not the city police chief taking over. I mean, is that how that typically would play out? Uh, I don't think it would typically play out that way in most communities. Uh, I don't know the dynamic in Uvalde. Uh, we did see that the school district police department is a very small force. Under those circumstances, it's the city police department that would presumably have greater resources or a county sheriff's department that would presumably have greater resources and a greater level of tactical awareness uh, because of the type of training that they do, that they would not have taken over that scene and, and inserted themselves. And Jared, this is a very broad question, but I mean, so many people reacting to what we're learning about this response feel that they've never heard uh, of something considered that they could consider reckless, irresponsible, or that openly cost the lives of children. You're somebody that knows this just about as well as anyone could. Uh, having been in the middle uh, of situations like this, having been at the top uh, of a police organization. I'm just curious, what is your response to the way these officers and the way uh, the people in charge decided to act on that day? So uh, from having lived through this and spending an entire career in this business, I, I understand how officers can maybe take that moment and slow down and assess what they're dealing with and question whether they're dealing with an active shooter still or if this has transitioned into a barricade. I, I understand that. I don't understand the timeline that elapsed and the fact that they stayed with that. They knew that children had been wounded. They knew that they had 911 calls, which presumably went into a dispatch center and should have been communicated to those officers that were in the hallway. Uh, and they know that he wasn't in there alone. And there's certainly a lot more that we'll learn about this response, but as it, the facts as we know them now, this was a catastrophic failure uh, there in Texas. Thank you, Jared Bergwan. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Next tonight, we want to turn to Houston, where the NRA is holding its annual convention just a few hundred miles away from the tragedy in Uvalde, and that's drawing large protests. It comes as the, the debate over gun control has reopened in Washington, D.C., as members of Congress debate what, if anything, can and should be done to stop this carnage that keeps happening again and again. ABC's Rachel Scott has been pressing for answers. She has this report. Nearly 300 miles away from the Uvalde massacre, the largest gun rights organization in the nation is gathering. Hey, hey, NRA, how many kids have you killed today? Pro 
protesters rallying outside the NRA convention in Houston, Texas. We need to remember who we need to organize against, and that is those people in there. Right. Why did you decide to come out? Because my daughter is a teacher, and she had to learn how to pack bullet wounds in her classroom in order to teach. I'm done having to worry about every single day that she goes to class, and I'm going to get the phone call that she is blown into pieces for trying to protect her children. I shouldn't go to school and be scared that I, I could get hurt that day because we can't control our guns. And I shouldn't, I shouldn't have to worry about that. I want to see change. Yes. I want to see change. Inside the NRA convention. I'm honored to be here in the great state of Texas with the wonderful patriots of the NRA. As former President Donald Trump and Texas Senator Ted Cruz took the stage, attendees told us guns aren't the issue. Do you think America has a gun problem? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Teresa Wakefield, a gun owner and grandmother of 13, says after Uvalde, Lawmakers should reconsider the legal age to buy a gun. Why should you be able to buy weapons at 18? It's heartbreaking. But guns don't kill people. People kill people. The guns didn't jump in the truck. The guns didn't run to the school. The guns didn't do it. That young boy did. Back in Washington, the debate over reform is heating up. After nearly 30 years of congressional inaction on gun control, Republican leader Mitch McConnell giving the green light on bipartisan talks, encouraging Texas Senator John Cornyn to work with Democrats to find common ground. I'm not interested in the same old tired talking points. I'm actually interested in what we can do to make the terrible events that occurred in Uvalde less likely in the future. Cornyn returning to Washington just back from the tragedy in Uvalde. Speaking with Democratic Senator Chris Murphy, his home state of Connecticut, rocked by the Sandy Hook massacre 10 years ago. How long are you willing to give this in order to reach some type of agreement? Uh, oh, we don't have a lot of time. I mean, there's a sense of urgency in the country. Um, I don't think the American people are going to let us be in conversation for you know, a month. We have a number of areas that we think we can make progress on, background checks, red flag laws, additional support for school security. Those issues backed by the majority of Americans. 86% back a national red flag law, allowing authorities to temporarily take guns away from people determined to be dangerous. And nearly 90% of Americans support expanded background checks. It's far from clear if Democrats can get the 10 Republican votes needed to pass any gun control legislation. But a small bipartisan group says they're willing to try. Are there 60 votes for that? It's a little bit early to uh, try to protect the outcome, but there's clearly a lot of interest. So we went out on the hunt for answers on Capitol Hill to find out what, if anything, Republicans would support. Can you assure the American people that this time something will get done? I can't assure the American people there's any law we can pass to stop this shooting. Some refuse to take our questions. Do you, do you support expanded background checks? The majority of Americans support it. Do you support it? After the mass shooting in Texas, will Republicans take action on gun control legislation? The majority of Americans support background checks. Do you support it? Others said gun reform is a non-starter. Passing more, more laws without enforcing what's already on the books would seem somewhat pointless to me. The majority of Americans support some type of action when it comes to gun reform. Is your party wrong on this? Are you wrong on this? We, we need to, um, to look at what solutions have worked and haven't worked. But if the so, majority I mean, of Americans say background checks... Ma'am, I realize, I realize you have a point of view, but I've been happy to it's answer It's the point of view of the American people, sir. When questioned about background checks, Republican Senator Rick Scott ended our interview. Red flag second, laws when it take away guns. Okay, would you like me to finish or are you going to do it? Okay, you do it. Senate Democrats can change the rules to pass gun reform legislation without Republican support. But moderate Democrats Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema are not on board with ending the filibuster. Senator Sinema, do you support changing the Senate Sorry, rules guys. in order We're to pass gun control legislation? Right. 19 children are dead. Thanks so much. Can you give us a comment about it? Here in these halls, David Hogg, also on a mission. A survivor of the 2018 Parkland school shooting, who first spoke out as a 17-year-old. We're not trying to take your guns. We never have been and we never will. Today, he's 22. 
and still fighting for change. I'm frustrated, outraged, but more than anything, I'm just exhausted because we've done our job. We've done our job right. The mistake that we made in the after Parkland was that as young people, we assumed that we had a government that even halfway worked. This week, Democratic leader Chuck Schumer blocked a Republican proposal named after two Parkland school shooting victims aimed at addressing school safety. Hardening schools would have done nothing to prevent this shooting. And Republicans blocked a Democratic bill aimed at targeting domestic terrorism in the wake of the Buffalo shooting. But this bill would be more accurately called the Democrat plan to brand and insult our police and soldiers as white supremacists and neo-Nazis. So after two mass shootings in just over a week, senators left town for recess with gun legislation very much up in the air. Senator Graham, are there enough Republicans to get this passed? It's certainly not the first door slammed in the face of potential gun reform. Rachel Scott joins me now. Rachel, we heard from some of those NRA members in your piece there. We know that some popular gun reforms like expanded background checks, red flag laws, many Americans support them. Did you find any members of the NRA that supported them too? Actually, Trevor, we did. Almost every single member of the NRA that we spoke to today did uh, support some type of gun reform, whether it was background checks, some type of red flag law, and even just saying that an 18-year-old should not be able to purchase such a powerful weapon. We're really seeing some of the faces of the poll numbers that we've been talking about. 89% of Americans, the overwhelming majority, supporting some form of background checks. Trevor? Could be a change in Americans' views, but will it change the politicians' views? Rachel Scott, we appreciate your work. Thank you. And also tonight, severe weather and tornado watches are sweeping through parts of the region. It's disrupting holiday weekend travel, canceling some flights, and making a mess of some of the roads. ABC senior meteorologist Rob Marciano joins us now. Rob, just how soon could all of this clear out? I think it's going to take a little bit of time, uh, Trevor. We just had the most intense line of thunderstorms roll through the New York metro area, but the upper low still has to come through. And the mid-Atlantic really has been the hardest hit. They've had over six dozen uh, damaging wind reports, and now a severe thunderstorm watch is posted again for pretty much the same areas that got hit this morning. So Virginia, you currently have a couple of tornado warnings in there, and you can see the upper low spinning over Ohio. That will keep most everybody in the Northeast unsettled for another day tomorrow, and then things begin to clear out after that. But tomorrow will be unsettled. And then Sunday and Monday, nearly everybody east of the Mississippi is going to see temperatures that will be above average, especially come Monday. Temperatures could touch 90 degrees in Louisville, Chicago, maybe even New York City uh, and, and, and places like D.C. But west of there, we could do have a severe weather threat. A series of, of fronts will come through the northwest and the northern uh, Rockies and then the northern Midwest, and it'll be uh, relatively uh, stormy there. But here in the east, uh, you're going to want to head to the beaches to cool off come Monday after Memorial Day services. Trevor? Let the rain wash off the tops of the barbecues. Rob Marciano, thank you. You bet. And when we come back, a deadly house explosion in Pennsylvania, what may have triggered it, plus closing arguments in the defamation trial between Johnny Depp and Amber Heard will break down how each side made their final case. And our Eva Pilgrim with an examination of harmful stereotypes in Hollywood impacting the Asian American community, plus the efforts to overcome them. We'll be right back. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast. Now streaming on ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. The hottest news in daytime are happening right here. We talk about things on this show that people don't talk about. That I can't wait to see. Honest takes from strong women. We need all hands on deck and we need it right now. This is the time to speak out unafraid to get real. We stick by our points of view. We're all seeing it differently and that's the beauty of The View. And that's why the most watched number one daytime talk show is The View. Now streaming on ABC News Live. 
Is that the gun? That's not the gun. What is it? I won't ask you again, then. Are you an IT? <laughs> the deeper you go into the black market, you could be putting your life at risk. The darker it gets. Why hasn't anyone come out and spoken? It's about the money, that's all we do. Trafficked. New episodes Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. America is being poisoned with fentanyl, and we don't even know it. Just heard my wife screaming. She told me they had just died. 50 to 100 times more potent than morphine. Keep breathing, come on. It's poison, it's pure poison. A few grains of salt worth of fentanyl will kill you. Just my agency has seized enough to kill the entire country. ABC News Live presents Poisoned, America's Fentanyl Crisis, the powerful series streaming free on ABC News Live. Welcome back. We want to turn now to a look at the diversity and the accomplishments of the Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander community as part of ABC News' Soul of a Nation franchise. Our Eva Pilgrim held some candid conversations with generations of Asian American actors on overcoming harmful Hollywood stereotypes as part of tonight's Together as One special. Take a look. The leading roles uh, in men and women were played by white actors, you know. And even I experienced that in my acting with uh, J. Carol Nash uh, playing Charlie Chan. Every morning he had to put those eyepieces on and, and, and slant his eye a little talk and he talked kind of funny like this. Hunch, not important. Motive, clue. Things that count. For women, there's the dragon lady, as well as the docile lotus flower, and all the women are hypersexualized. Hollywood representation is so powerful. All those kind of stereotypes then become their perception of what an Asian is like. These crude stereotypes persisted into the 80s and well beyond. What's happening, hot stuff? But perhaps the single most infamous and offensive role in the 80s depicting an Asian was the character of Long Duck Dong in the John Hughes teen comedy, 16 Candles. Oh, sexy girlfriend! Manzai! I was excited to do it. I thought it was comedy. I knew Long Duck Dong was stereotypical, but I really just wanted to work, you know, just as an actor. Do you need to feed yourself? <laughs> yeah, exactly. What I didn't perceive is how it would affect people, you know, after it came out. I get people coming up to me and <laughs> getting angry at me. Did it feel like people were blaming you for it? At first it did. But I think that the role had to happen in order to catapult people into figuring out, what is this? What do we do about it? In 2002, my agent sent the audition for Austin Powers and Goldmember. And at the time, that movie franchise was like the highlight of the summer. Being young and ambitious, I was like, this is great. I have to do this. Your name is? Fukumi. Don't behave, baby. This role gets held up as an example of the fetishization of Asian women and the hypersexualization. That sucks. And, you know, but I take responsibility. That was me. I took that role. And, you know, I think processing it is, it's tough. This is my twin sister. Her name, fuck you. To play the role of her twin sister, Mizoda recruited fellow dancer Carrie Ann Inaba, now a judge on Dancing with the Stars. 
I thought it was really a funny role. I hate that somebody could be offended. When I hear the commentary that's out there, it scares me because I think comedy is important to have. I think we must be able to laugh at ourselves. Do you feel the pressure of representation? You know, there's, there's not room for lots of us. So when you're the one, mm -hmm. does that carry extra weight? I always feel the pressure of representation. And every time I'm there, I try to show people me and all the complexity of who I am and that I'm not a stereotype. That's Eva Pilgrim reporting, and you can see much more of ABC News' Soul of a Nation special, Together as One, tonight on ABC and on Hulu. And still ahead here on Prime, what comes next after today's closing arguments in the trial between Johnny Depp and Amber Heard? Plus, Russia makes small gains in eastern Ukraine as President Zelensky calls for more support from the U.S., what it means for the fight ahead. And we take a look at a busy holiday weekend of travel coming up ahead by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day, if you want to feel old, Remember that iconic photo of a five-year-old boy asking to touch former President Obama's hair in the Oval Office? Well, he is now all grown up. He graduated from high school. We'll be right back. The deeper you go into black markets, the darker it gets. Traffic, Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions. Straightforward reporting. No spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. This is ABC News Live. The crushing the families Trump. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Is that the gun? That's not the gun. What is it? I won't ask you again, then. Are you a Nazi? <laughs> the deeper you go into black markets, you could be putting your life at risk. The darker it gets. Why hasn't anyone come out and spoken? It's about the money. That's all we do. Trafficked. New episodes Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. These days, with so much going on, it's hard to keep up. While others are recapping yesterday's headlines, we're bringing you the right now. This is the busy border crossing. Steel barricades, another strike. The right now look at the day ahead, how it affects you and your family. Record high gas prices. The threat of cyber warfare. Is peace possible? World News Now beginning at 2 a.m. Eastern, followed by America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. Streaming here on ABC News Live. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7, there for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated abcnews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at abcnews.com. And here's to everything ahead. For many, including I'm sure many watching at home, the dash to enjoy this Memorial Day weekend has already started, and this year everything seems to be bigger. We have a lot more people on the move, but we also have higher prices, and we do actually have bigger sales. So here's what to expect by the numbers. More than 39 million Americans are expected to take to the roads and skies this holiday weekend, despite those rising gas and plane ticket prices. That's 8% more than last year, nearly reaching pre-pandemic levels. AAA predicts 90% of Memorial Day travel is going to be by car, and that's going to bring heavy traffic to popular destinations. But actually, air travel is going to see the biggest spike. 25% more people will be flying to their weekend getaways this year. Now, for those who are just hitting the backyard, 84% of holiday picnic planners told a recent survey that they plan to adjust their menus in reaction to the rising cost of food. You're going to be paying 20% more for beef and chips this year, 15% more for sodas. But 
holiday shoppers can expect up to 70% off some products like JCPenney's Air Fryer on sale for $80. Retailers are eager to offload their unsold extra stock, so that is a small silver lining to those rising prices. And one thing is clear, whether your holiday plans involve hitting the road, the skies, the backyard, you will finally have lots of company this year. And we have much more here ahead on Prime. The official countdown begins for Queen Elizabeth's Platinum Jubilee celebration. Plus, Top Gun returns to the big screen this weekend. Will it be the summer blockbuster to revive the box office? And my conversation with the creator of a new comedy series taking a look at how the U.S. government impacts our everyday lives. The first to look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. So much at stake in our world right now. We wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. National parks are incredibly safe places, but crime will happen. Hey, my mom. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. This afternoon, Texas Department of Safety officials admitting that officers who first responded to Robb Elementary should have acted sooner to take down the gunman. Hey, from the, from the benefit of hindsight, where I'm sitting now, the, of course it was not the right decision. It was a wrong decision, period. At 11.44, 14 minutes after the first 911 call was made, 19 officers from various agencies made it outside the classroom door where the suspect was barricaded behind a locked door. But they did not go in. Instead, they waited for a tactical team, which arrived about 30 minutes later. Just two months before this tragedy, Uvalde School District had trained for an incident like this, holding an active shooter response drill. The NRA holds its annual convention in Houston Friday through Sunday, headlined by former President Donald Trump. Protesters are calling for the complete cancellation of the convention. What I'm asking for the NRA to do is to cancel itself. Cancel yourself right now. A federal judge today dismissed former President Donald Trump's lawsuit against New York State Attorney General Letitia James. The ruling comes a day after a state appeals court upheld a lower court ruling requiring Trump to testify in James's investigation into Trump's businesses. 
It's day 92 of Russia's invasion. The British Defense Ministry says Russian forces have taken several villages in the Donbass region. In addition to attacks, Russia is accused of holding global food supplies hostage in Ukraine, not allowing commercial vessels to enter or leave by ship. President Zelensky warning that food prices are likely to rise further and also saying that he's creating plans to try and take some of that produce out by rail. But analysts warning us that would take an incredibly long time. President Zelensky is urging the U.S. and European allies to send more heavy weapons for Ukraine to defend against attacks. Authorities are searching for the cause of a deadly house explosion in Pottstown, Pennsylvania, about 40 miles outside of Philadelphia. The blast killed five people and injured two more. The area littered with debris in the aftermath. One of the survivors is in critical but stable condition now. Neighbors reportedly say they frequently smell gas in the area. Investigators still not sure what triggered the explosion. In Maryland this morning, President Joe Biden delivered the commencement address at the U.S. Naval Academy in Annapolis. During his commencement address at the Naval Academy Friday, President Biden congratulated the class of 2022 for their hard work and told them they were graduating during a major inflection point for the world. The president saying the next decade could shape the future for generations to come, specifically citing Russia's invasion of Ukraine. This Memorial Day weekend, Maverick is cleared for takeoff. Top Gun Maverick, that is. The highly anticipated, long-awaited sequel to the 1986 classic Top Gun. While Maverick looks to be the first blockbuster of the summer season, more upcoming big-budget films are expected to get audiences off the couch and into theaters. A huge gift for theater owners and the movie industry. Also ahead this summer, Chris Pratt and his prehistoric co-stars in Jurassic World Dominion to infinity and beyond. In June, it's to infinity and beyond with Disney Pixar's Lightyear and... I was going to say that was very, very impressive what you did back there. It'll be fireworks and lightning bolts from the ultimate Avenger, Thor Love and Thunder, clapping into theaters for the 4th of July. And after an exhaustive six weeks, the jury in the trial between Johnny Depp and Amber Heard is finally deliberating. Today, attorneys for both stars made their closing arguments. Depp is suing Heard for $50 million in Virginia over a December 2018 op-ed that she wrote in the Washington Post describing herself as a public figure representing domestic abuse. Depp's lawyers say he was defamed by this article, though he was never mentioned by name. Heard filed a $100 million counterclaim against Depp after his lawyer called her allegations a hoax. So, to cut through all the noise, joining us now is celebrity divorce attorney Chris Melcher. And Chris, thank you for being here. Before we get in too deep, I want to play uh, a quick soundbite of portions of the closing arguments from both sides. First is going to be from Depp's attorney and then from Heard's. Take a listen. When Mr. Depp brought this case for defamation, Ms. Heard went all in. She spun a story of shocking overwhelming, brutal abuse. She came into this courtroom prepared to give the performance of her life, and she gave it. It's not about who's the better spouse. It's not about whether you think Ms. Heard may have been abusive to Mr. Depp. It's not. Because remember, if you think that they were both abusive to each other, then Amber wins. They're trying to trick you into thinking that Amber has to be perfect in order to win. So let's start with Depp's attorney. I know both sides, Chris, have accused each other of performances in the, fa the sake of their testimony. Throughout this whole trial, Depp's attorneys have been more aggressive. What did you make of their closing argument? I, I thought uh, Depp's attorney did a compelling job explaining that we spend our lifetime creating our reputation and it could be taken away from us in a moment. And that's what happened to Johnny Depp when Amber Heard came out and said that she was the victim of all of this horrific abuse at the hands of Johnny Depp when he's saying no, that he was the victim and she was the aggressor. So I think that they landed those points and he also established he's not there for money, he's there for his name. Of course, uh, something that we've had to kind of stress to people as they've watched, millions of people have watched this trial live now for the past six weeks, is the fact that this isn't a contest of who was the worst uh, partner in this marriage. Uh, it's a defamation case about whether or not Amber Heard lied and Depp's attorneys having to prove that, which is something that Amber Heard's attorneys pointed to in their closing arguments. I mean, is he right basically saying if both of them were abusive, then Amber wins this case? 
That's right, Trevor. It's a hard case for Johnny because how do you define abuse? And could that be just the, the verbal altercations that they had or unkind words that he used? And maybe that falls within the definition of abuse. But she went further in her op-ed and she actually talked about sexual violence. So she's right that he has to establish that this was not an abusive relationship. So that is a, a challenge for him to do, but over the course of this trial, we did see consistently that she was the aggressor, and these are tape recordings of her, in her own words, pursuing him in a very aggressive and hateful way. I know that you don't have a crystal ball. There's, of course, a lot to chew on over the course of a six-week trial, but at, the, at its core is a relatively simple question. So how long do you think that the jury's gonna need to talk all of this over and come up with a verdict? I anticipate that they're going to come back on maybe Thursday because there's a lot of evidence to look at. The law has to be considered, and, and they're going to take their job seriously. And to me, sounds about Thursday is about right to go through all that information. Uh, you touched on the reputation thing just real quick, Chris. Even if Johnny Depp loses, do you think that given the public's reaction to this trial, he's already won? Absolutely, Trevor. He has won. There is a sea of support for him online, not just fans, but other people who see what happened to him. He did get his name back. I think he'll be just fine no matter how this jury turns out. Of course, there's tens of millions of dollars still at stake. Chris Melcher, we appreciate your insight. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Trevor. And we are also tracking several headlines from around the world tonight. This week, heavy fighting in the Democratic Republic of Congo has forced more than 72,000 people from their homes. A rebel group claiming to represent the interests of ethnic Tutsis, Tutsis is mounting its largest offensive in a decade. Some disappointing news for those who hope to see Venezuelan oil exports resume to ease pricing pressure at American pumps. U.S. authorities today renewed a very limited license that allows Chevron to only carry out basic upkeep of its wells in conjunction with the state-owned oil company. Venezuela sits atop the world's largest oil reserves, but production has been declining steadily for decades. And the official countdown to Queen Elizabeth's platinum Jubilee kicked off this morning. Celebrations marking the 96-year-old monarch 70 years on the throne will take place the first week of June. Well, if you mix comedy with curiosity and a whole lot of civics, you get The G Word with Adam Conover. It's a new documentary-style series that gives us an inside look at how the U.S. government impacts our everyday lives. Take a look. You folks here, you're sending messages to the satellite to check right. on it, to adjust to what it's doing, et cetera, and you're coordinating that from here. Exactly. Can I ask you a personal question? Sure. How old are you? 20 years old. OK. When I was 20 years old, I was a <laughs> man. I couldn't have been doing this. Joining us now, the show's creator, writer, executive producer, star, Adam Conover. Adam, appreciate you being here. Let's cut right to it. Government, sure. good or bad? <laughs> Well, we tried to take a more nuanced view than that. On the show, we investigate all the ways the government affects our lives, good and bad. And what we found is there are lots of shocking ways that the government really makes life in America possible. The government runs our GPS system. The government inspects every single piece of meat you eat. The government flies planes into hurricanes to figure out where they're going. But there's also a lot of areas in which the government isn't serving us or is hurting or even killing people it shouldn't be. And we talk about those as well on the show. And you know, Adam, uh, people probably know you from your previous show, Adam Ruins Everything, and I know that that's a tongue-in-cheek name, but you definitely took down a lot of topics. And I've heard you say, talking about this show a few times, that your aim is for it to be anti-cynical. Uh, can you explain yeah. on that a little bit more? Well... Look, cynicism is taking a default negative view on everything, right? Nobody could possibly be doing anything for good reasons. And what we found on this show is that in reality, they are. Uh, my favorite part of the show is we did field pieces where I met the workers who are working day to day uh, with the government, making our lives possible. You know, because the FDIC, right, who keep your money safe in the bank, could make a lot more money working for Goldman Sachs. But they show up every day to that job because they know it serves an important purpose, and they really give a crap about the mission and about keeping Americans safe. And that was incredibly inspiring to see. For all the many criticisms that we have of the government on the show, that was gave, gave me an incredibly positive view. You know, it's interesting, Adam, because... Probably the show that's most famous for blending comedy and the government is The Daily Show. And I can remember mm -hmm. Jon Stewart saying that he had butted heads a little bit with former President Barack Obama over cynicism. 
Former president thought he was a little bit cynical. President Obama is part of this project here too, right? Yeah, he is. Uh, uh, President, former President Obama executive produced this show, uh, and his company optioned the book by Michael Lewis, The Fifth Risk, upon which the show is based. And he appears on the show at the beginning in order for us to set the tone of what the show is going to be. Because what I say to him at the beginning of the show is, look, uh, you can't control what I say on this show because otherwise it's going to be propaganda. And he says, yeah, no, that's true. Go off and make the show you want to make. And that is true that his organization gave me editorial independence when I made this show. And as a result, we told a lot of stories that are not stories that former President Obama would have chosen to tell if it were him writing all of the scripts. Which was more difficult about that conversation, that he's a former president or that he was your boss? <laughs> well, here's the thing. I had to, uh, you know, forget the fact that he is my boss in that context, because the truth is I carved out my own zone of, uh, of creative freedom, right? So, uh, look, my job as a comedian is to provoke power, is to not bend down in front of power, is to, is to you know, poke the eye of the bear. That's what I did when I was on True TV, when I was on uh, cable, uh, ad-supported television, and we would do stories telling the truth about advertising scams. And I knew that was the same thing that we would have to do here, that we would have to address it head on. You mentioned that the series is uh, loosely based off of The Fifth Risk by Michael Lewis. I have it right here because it was right yeah. on top of the pile in my office. It's a great book by uh, one of America's most prolific writers who, yeah. in his book, definitely like gets entrenched in the minutiae of the government and finds these interesting details that a lot of people don't think about. Uh, Adam, when I joined ABC, coming from local news, I started out in D.C., would report from the Capitol, the White House, different locations. And the thing that struck me most that was both profound and obvious is that top to bottom, it's just people all across the board. No matter what the job is, no matter how much power, it's just a person with the same issues that every person I've ever met would deal with. Is that your experience with this show too? Absolutely. Uh, that is the, in fact, the message at the end of the show is that the government is nothing but people all the way down. And so when the government makes mistakes, it's because uh, the same, the same reason things don't work in your office, that's the reason things don't work in the government. You can find that and a whole lot more episodes of The G Word available to stream right now on Netflix. Adam Conover, thanks so much for being here. Hey, thank you for having me. And before we go tonight, the image of the day heading into the holiday weekend, a hot air balloon named America One floating over a lake in Omaha, Nebraska. We hope that you have a great weekend and enjoy the time off uh, after what has been certainly a very difficult week for our country. That is our show for this hour. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. And thank you for streaming with us and have a great weekend. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming.